On December 16th, former South Carolina Governor and United Nations Ambassador Nikki Haley wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post imploring President-elect Biden not to outright abandon the Trump administration's major foreign policy aims. She advocated that Biden continue the Trump administration's stance towards China, keep pressure on Latin American dictatorships, and continue to foster Arab-Israeli peace negotiations. Concerning China, Haley wrote, Communist China is the most serious global threat the United States faces. It is a strategic competitor with hostile intentions of overtaking us economically and militarily. This truth explains why Trump pursued a military buildup, punished Chinese companies for stealing U.S. trade secrets, sanctioned Chinese companies, leaders, and firms for their horrific human rights abuses, and strengthened coordination with U.S. allies and partners to hold China accountable. Biden would endanger U.S. interests if he reversed course. The link to the op-ed is in the description box below if you would like to read it for yourself. Our friends over at TYT covered this on their show, and their response was predictable. So this whole talk of China being a military threat so that we have to spend more on uh, defense companies and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and support politicians like Nikki Haley is sophisticated lying, and it's very, very dangerous lies. And so- It is, it is. And, and the fact I, that the mainstream media gives it more credibility makes it more dangerous than a guy like Trump in some ways. No, you guys, I mean, look, the um, very the very obvious uh, pivot to China is, is something that people should be paying very close attention to um, because there is a concerted effort um, by private military contractors to start heavily militarizing that region of the world. And if you look at where the funding comes from, remember Nikki Haley until very recently served on the board of Boeing. So um, when you look at what persuades uh, our politicians to, to focus so heavily on China, again, just look at these think tanks that are heavily funded by defense contractors, foreign countries as well. And then they go off and they do the lobbying in, in Washington to persuade our lawmakers, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, to have a more hardline approach toward China with uh, the first step of militarizing countries in that region. Of course, Jang and Anna resorted to their unified explanation of everything, money and politics. The only reason why Haley is advocating for this position is that she's on the take. As I've said before, attacking people's motives and declaring them sellouts is Jenks' go-to explanation for why non-progressives do what they do. That's the essence of the money in politics argument. The funny thing is, Jank is currently facing this accusation himself from Jimmy Dore, thanks to their disagreement over the force the vote issue, which is hilarious. This is not a strategy disagreement. Everybody agrees with hashtag force the vote. The people who are against it it's inexplicable, and you're not supposed to question their motives. I question their motives. Cenk Uger's on the take, and he, he's working for the Democratic Party, and he's working for his corporate donors, Jeffrey Katzenberg, Buddy Romer, right-wingers. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. Money and politics can be bifurcated into two different but related topics. One is the idea that the amount of money spent on a campaign determines the winner. I talked about this just a few weeks ago, and while the video I made is by no means the final word on the topic, I'd say that the evidence, at the very least, strongly suggests that no, money cannot buy an election. Today we're going to talk about the other concept under the umbrella of money and politics. The idea that donor money produces policy outcomes that are antithetical to what is prudent, what the voting public wants, or both. And when people like Jenk invoke donors, he means wealthy Americans who donate to campaigns and parties directly, spend money on independent expenditures, lobby politicians directly, or employ people who are involved in politics at one point in their life. This part of the money and politics narrative is much more complicated than the electoral question. First, let me start with a concession. Does donor money affect policy outcomes? Yes, it certainly can. Does that include bad outcomes that could reasonably be called corrupt or rent-seeking? Sure. That said, there's something very important that I need to make clear right off the bat. Jank calls campaign donations bribes. The only guy who isn't worried is Lindsey Graham, because he just got paid $54,000. It's organized, legalized bribery. Our politicians are fundamentally corrupt. The system is corrupting. They can't get elected if they don't have the money. And the people who have the money are the ones that are get, gonna get $10 billion contracts. 
politicians are not allowed to pocket the money that people donate to their campaigns. That actually is illegal. I honestly think some people don't know this. Duncan Hunter was just pardoned by President Trump for doing just that. But yes, donating to a politician's campaign, even though they can't use the money for themselves, can still influence policy outcomes. The problem with Jank and his acolytes is that they assume that almost all policy outcomes they disapprove of are exclusively the result of donor money, and that politicians who aren't totally in line with the progressive agenda adhere almost exclusively to the wealthy people who fund their campaigns. The reason I call this a fallacy is because it's myopic. Kevin D. Williamson's first law of politics is that everything is simple when you don't know the first f***ing thing about it. One of the reasons Jank and those like him feel that they can speak on so many issues with authority is because they think things are that simple. There's the progressive vision on a given issue, which of course is the correct position. Then there's the corporate, corrupt, corporatist, establishment, corporationist, neoliberal, corporationism, conservative, something something corporate vision. And the only thing you need to know about the latter is that it exists to serve the donor class. This isn't how they explain every issue, just most of them. And one of the reasons they think this way is because they don't actually understand the issues they're talking about, least of all the perspective of people who disagree with them. To help actually explain the potential motivations of Haley and those who agree with her, let's look at something similar from history. The United States faced a very similar set of circumstances with another one of America's rivals about 25 years ago. During the Clinton administration, there was a lot of debate over whether or not NATO should be expanded to include former communist and Soviet states like Poland, the Czech Republic, Hungary, and the Baltic nations. I've talked about this issue before, but today I want to look at it purely from a standpoint of U.S. domestic political survival. Let's take ideology entirely out of the equation. Besides, we all know that people like me, who believe that American global hegemony is a good thing, are just shills for the military-industrial complex. At least, that's how populists on the left and the right think they can dismiss us. So, for the sake of today's video, I just want to look at things descriptively, not proscriptively. Let's merely assume that politicians are looking at this from a standpoint of getting reelected. If a politician is totally cynical, should he or she vote to expand the treaty to include these nations and potentially aggravate Russia, or vote no and leave these vulnerable countries to fend for themselves? At first glance, it would appear that Jenks' overall theory is correct. There was an enormous amount of money spent by defense contractors on campaigns and lobbying efforts encouraging politicians to vote in favor of expansion. These old Eastern Bloc nations would need to update their military equipment in order to join the treaty. Their old Soviet kit was falling apart, and it wasn't really compatible with Western technology, software, and arms, so these nations would have to build almost entirely new arsenals. And of course, one of the terms of joining NATO is that member nations have to spend at least 2% of their GDP on their military. With all that in mind, American defense contractors looked at Congress debating NATO expansion, and they saw dollar signs. If even one of these nations were to be welcomed into the treaty, that would mean a huge windfall for their business. What industry wouldn't want new markets to sell to? So the U.S. defense industry did what a lot of other industries do. They spent a ton of money on electioneering and lobbying. According to a New York Times article written at the time, America's six biggest military contractors have spent $51 million on lobbying in the last two years. According to an analysis prepared by the New York Times by the Campaign Study Group, a research company in Springfield, Virginia, if lobbying costs were included from all companies that perform military-related activities, like computer and technology firms, they would dwarf the lobbying effort of any other industry. The military industry also remains the most generous contributor to congressional candidates, the study group said, giving nearly equally to Democrats and Republicans. Four dozen companies whose main business is arms have showered candidates with $32.3 million since the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe at the beginning of the decade. By comparison, the tobacco industry spent $26.9 million in that same period, 1991 to 1997. Like any other American manufacturer, they are looking for markets abroad. Said Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, a New York Democrat who opposes the proposed NATO expansion. Most every other customer they can think of, we have forbidden them to sell anything to. The sums spent on lobbying and campaign contributions are relatively small compared to the potential benefits in the new markets provided by a larger NATO, particularly from the sale of big ticket items like fighter aircraft. A single F-16 made by Lockheed Martin costs about $20 million. A single F-18 made by Boeing costs about $40 million to $60 million. Poland alone wants to buy 100 to 150 planes and is weighing offers from Lockheed and Boeing, as well as companies in Britain, France, and Russia. So there you have it. Looks like Jank was right. 
NATO was expanded after all. The defense industry bought politicians with campaign donations, which secured their election victories, and the politicians did their bidding. Well, again, I don't actually think the campaign spending has a great impact on who wins an election, but that's not important for this video. As long as politicians believe that it does, which as I understand, most of them do, they're going to seek out campaign donations in the interest of getting reelected. But like I said earlier, thinking that this is the end of the story is myopic, to say the least of it. If TYT existed at the time, I'm sure that Jenk and Anna would have covered this issue this way, declared that all the people pushing expansion were shills for the defense industry, and then cried, this is why we need to get money out of politics, wolf packcom The problem for them is that it wasn't just money from defense contractors that incentivized politicians to vote in favor of NATO expansion. There were actual voters, communities of them in fact, that were staunchly in favor of enlargement. And they were willing to vote on it. Eastern European ethnic communities within the United States were very hawkish on NATO expansion. This is understandable given that many of these people had relatives who languished under the Soviet domination of the Eastern Bloc. Czech neighborhoods in Wisconsin and Nebraska, Polish enclaves in New York and Pennsylvania, and Hungarian populations in Ohio and California were a driving force behind NATO expansion. At the time, opponents of NATO expansion accused their rivals of political expedience on this front. As Peter Conradi wrote in Who Lost Russia, on the other side of the Atlantic, the Times also joined the critics, attributing Clinton's enthusiasm for enlargement to his desire to please the Polish constituency in Michigan. European and American leaders are but months away from implementing a plan that risks undermining the credibility of NATO, weakening the hand of reformers in Russia, and reducing, not enhancing, the real security of countries in Central and Eastern Europe. Politics involving the old country loom large within immigrant communities in the United States. This is something that a lot of Americans with roots that go back far don't necessarily appreciate, but it's something that Cenk and Anna know all too well. I'm just gonna say it real quick, Nagorno-Karabakh, it also should be pointed out that Armenia did not listen uh, to a UN resolution uh, saying that that is not their land. Uh, so that's the two sides of yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, look, Jenk, you and I can talk about this story more in depth, but a UN resolution by countries that don't even recognize the Armenian genocide, yeah, that yeah, was their yeah. land, that was historically their land, and it was handed no. over. No, yes, you, you sound like an Israeli right winger, no, honestly. No, it's not true. Jenk, uh, that area. It was area my land 2,000 years ago. Okay. I don't recognize the United Nations. Okay. Well, that's convenient, right? So, look, yeah. I'm not saying who's right or yeah. wrong, and I got no dog in that fight. I really don't. Uh, in terms of, I don't know the Azerbaijan internal politics versus Armenian internal politics. I do. Okay, all right, yeah, but you can't conveniently say, hey, UN resolutions don't count when it's my ethnicity. Okay, UN resolutions do count, and so that gets held over Turkey's head on Cyprus for 50 years. Then when Armenia does it, oh no, it's okay, UN resolutions don't mean anything. We hold it over Israel's head. That they're doing things that are against the United Nations and the whole world agrees on. So we have to be consistent. So that's my uh, take on yeah, it. Yeah, but I, I think I think it's also incredibly relevant to talk about the fact that we have ethnic Armenians who have been living there literally for centuries, living their lives, you not doing anything Turks wrong, there literally there doing there nothing wrong, and and they're being attacked. Their churches are being bombed. Their hospitals did we know, are being did we bombed. Did we note that Armenia invaded in the first place? Did we know? Did we note that Armenians were already there? Did we note that, that they also did ethnic cleansing over. when they first okay. came in? Jake, okay, that, anyway. that, that land was handed over to Azerbaijan. Okay, by Stalin because Stalin was hoping that Turkey would uh, become an ally, and that didn't work out for Stalin. And because of what Stalin did, Armenians are suffering the consequences of his decisions from decades ago. Okay, the innocent civilians are dying as a result of that. Yeah, only innocent Armenians, right? No innocent. Yeah. Well, Azerbaijan. they're going to defend themselves, Jane. Oh, what do okay. You want them so when do? Azerbaijan defends itself, it's not defending. When Armenia defends itself, it's defense. Azerbaijan has broken every. Every single ceasefire Wait, that they who have broke agreed the United Nations every resolution single one of them. And every took the land in the them. first place. They have right, broken anyway, every single ceasefire. Anyway, cease now back to Erdogan. Okay. As you can see, the politics of the old country can invoke passionate responses in immigrant populations. Furthermore, Jenk and Anna actually seem to understand the complexities and nuances of an issue that is probably obscure to most Americans because they're actually invested in it. They probably wouldn't accept simple explanations for what's happening in that part of the world. The same was true for NATO expansion in the 1990s. At this point in time, Central and Eastern European ethnic populations played a role in America's foreign policy in the same way Cuban Americans in Southern Florida currently play with our country's policy toward their mother country. 
This is something Anna knows all too well because of her husband's family. It's exactly what you said, Anna. He's trying to appeal, and it's to a, a certain amount of the Cuban population in Florida that's very conservative and that hold a grudge from the Castro. Oh, believe me, I know. Now, and, and ben. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that these people are correct or that their priorities are in the right place. Those of you who watch this channel probably know where I stand on these issues, but that's neither here nor there. I'm saying that if you're a politician, and there's a significant ethnic population within your district. If you want to get reelected, you're probably going to vote to expand NATO to please that constituency. And again, we're talking about normal people here who actually vote, not billionaires and corporations that can give you money that you can use to attempt to persuade people to vote for you. This is an important distinction. Interestingly, TYT got a comment during one of their live shows pertaining to the third, and I would argue, most important factor in this equation. Linda Rivera wrote in our super chat, Jake, I happen to be a Raytheon employee who also supports the progressive movement and TYT. I think the work that uh, I do with the company is valuable to our society. You seem to demonize corporations as if they shouldn't exist. I feel torn thoughts. No, 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 Linda, not at all. Uh, actually, a very close family member of mine works at Boeing. And so, and and the district I ran in has tons of those uh, contractors and they have employees that work on great uh, projects related to advanced science, uh, related to satellites, et cetera. But I don't want them buying our government. I don't want them contributing millions of dollars and then yes, unfortunately, the main product is defense and so-called defense, it's actually offensive weapons. So if, do we need defensive weapons? Yes. Do we need as many as we have? Absolutely not. Is it because of the corruption due to their political donations? Absolutely. So Raytheon should exist, Boeing should exist, but they should not be able to contribute to and hence buy our politicians. A ton of people, including that viewer, including yours truly, work for companies that have military contracts. In 2010, progressive economist and former Clinton Labor Secretary Robert Reich estimated that around 1.6 million Americans work for companies that supply the military with everything from weapons to dining utensils. In 2018, industry experts estimated that the defense industry by itself was responsible for about 10% of American manufacturing jobs. Reich calls the military and its peripheral industries the federal government's largest jobs program, and he's not entirely wrong. I Ironically enough, it's people like Robert Reich and Cenk Uger and their Keynesian assumptions about how the economy can and should operate that's behind most of this. I think we should have a military for the sake of defense, not for the sake of creating jobs. And since there's no realistic option of privatization on this front, the government has to be involved. People like Cenk think that the government should use its taxing and spending powers for the sake of economic output. For example, the reason we should have a Green New Deal is not just to get us off carbon-based fuels, but to create millions and millions of jobs. The idea is to make it so big that it becomes something that the country can unite around, and which, by the way, would create an enormous amount of jobs, and why this is, in fact, a very popular proposal, including uh, huge percentages of Republicans who agree with it, the Republican voters. Now, of course, not the politicians. It's kind of amusing seeing this exact logic apply to things that leftists don't like. And this is one of the problems with Keynesian economics. Not an economic one, though there are plenty of those, but a political one. When you decide that the government should play a role in creating jobs in the economy, go figure, politically well-connected industries, even ones that you might not like, are going to play a role. In his 1935 State of the Union speech, FDR spoke about the potential hazards of government assistance. A large proportion of these unemployed and their dependents have been forced on the relief rolls. The lesson of history, confirmed by the evidence immediately before me, show conclusively the continued dependence upon relief induces a spiritual disintegration fundamentally destructive to the national fiber. To dole our relief in this way is to administer a narcotic, a subtle destroyer of the human spirit. It is inimical to the dictates of a sound policy. It is a violation of the traditions of America. Work must be found for able-bodied but destitute workers. The federal government must and shall quit this business of relief. His solution to the problem was for the government to create work for people instead of giving them mere assistance. What FDR didn't seem to realize is that people working for the government, or working on behalf of the government in some capacity, can be just as much of a dependent. And this is probably the biggest advantage defense contractors have. Millions of employees who vote. In his book, Unfree Speech, The Folly of Campaign Finance Reform, law professor Bradley Smith lays out the real reason why so many political lobbies have the clout they do. The NRA, with its large ideological membership, of course, may not be the typical special interest lobby. 
How do smaller, less ideological groups such as used car dealers, sugar beet growers, and the tobacco industry, to use three examples suggested by one critic, succeed? The answer is in much the same way as the NRA. For example, over 80,000 used car dealers dot the American landscape, employing tens of thousands of workers. Sugar beet growers can be found in every state from Ohio to California, and are often supported by a vast network of employees and suppliers. Couple this with the Democratic corn syrup industry, sugar beet growers provide over 420,000 jobs. These employees in turn have family members and friends, and in many small towns in the Midwest, the economy is contingent on the local processing facility. Similarly, the off-maligned tobacco industry can call on large numbers of voters throughout the Upper South, and even parts of Southern Ohio, Indiana, and Maryland, which are home to tobacco growers, processors, pickers, packagers, marketers, and more. Behind them stand millions of Americans who enjoy smoking, and may therefore oppose higher taxes, for example, on the product. So the defense industry has done something that all but guarantees political clout. It's aligned its interests with those of regular voters. Jobs in the defense industry are numerous, varied, in that they employ both white-collar and blue-collar employees, and widely dispersed enough that increasing weapon sales necessarily means boosting local economies of thousands of communities, and cutting defense spending means the opposite. After the Cold War ended, the defense industry had lost a great deal of business. NATO expansion was an opportunity to gain some of that back. So, for voters living within these communities, the policy preferences were obvious. Now, you may find this dynamic regrettable, and to a great extent I agree, but this is not something that can be solved by getting money out of politics, as Jenkins and his acolytes believe. Even if the federal government passed a bill tomorrow banning all lobbying, private employment by former public officials, ended private campaign donations, and went over to a system of entirely publicly funded campaigns, the defense industry would still have all of these voters on its side. And the same is true with ethnic politics. And here's another thing that makes those last two factors so important. To quote that New York Times article I read earlier, nor are the military contractors alone in their support for expansion, although a few other constituencies in the United States care as much. There has been virtually no organized opposition to NATO expansion, and the public has not been engaged. NATO expansion was a classic case of concentrated benefits and dispersed losses. There were various groups that had a lot to gain by expanding the treaty, and they were willing to throw their political weight behind it, while those who were against it didn't have nearly the same enthusiasm. So a lot of politicians had a lot of votes to gain by voting in favor of expansion, and almost nothing to gain by opposing it. While I'm personally glad that NATO expanded, it is true that it further inflamed tensions with Russia as many expected. Few people of importance outside of the Russians themselves were concerned about this, and despite what Rachel Maddow would have you believe, the Russians are not terribly influential when it comes to getting American politicians elected. So if you were a politician at the time, and you had purely cynical motives, the only thing you cared about was getting re-elected, then the way you'd vote should be obvious. Coming back to the present, we see a very similar dynamic with expansionist China. We have a nation that we're currently on rocky terms with whose neighbors are very nervous about, and understandably so. In my opinion, there are good ideological reasons why we should marginalize China on the global stage while increasing ties with its neighbors economically, diplomatically, and yes, militarily. But if we remove ideology from this, like we did with the NATO example, most of the same logic still applies with the case of China. Yes, the defense industry still lobbies the government, and they do have influence over important political figures. It is relevant to bring up Nikki Haley's relationship with Boeing. It's also true that ethnic politics plays a role in the containment of China as well, and the defense industry still employs millions of people. So even if we reduce the issue to pure political calculation, things are far more complicated than Jank and company think. Again, I think one of the reasons so many people look at politics this way is oversimplification. It provides a master key for explaining politics. If you can just look at OpenSecrets.org and figure out why a politician supports a given issue, you think you can speak with authority on any given topic. Follow the money. I'm going to always say follow the money. When you see people standing up like this, follow the trail of money and see where it leads, and then you'll know where their real interests lie. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's always the case. Uh, OpenSecrets.org, it's a great resource to know how these politicians are funded. And of course, this makes the solutions easy as well. In order to solve these problems, 
We just need to get money out of politics, aka implement stricter campaign finance reform. When that happens, democracy will do its work, and politicians will finally do what's right and listen to their constituents. But things are more complicated than that. It turns out, in order to figure out why things work the way they do, you actually have to do some actual research, which is far more than people like Jank are willing to do. So